Welcome to this edition of One on One. I'm Howie Rose, and we're joined right now by simply one of the best pure hitters that the New York Mets ever developed. The only problem was he wasn't around here as a Met quite long enough for Met fans to enjoy it, but he still made quite an impact on his days here in New York. It is great to see Hubie Brooks back in town. How are you doing, Hubie? I'm doing fine. Is this you. the first time you've been, never mind just a city field, but back in New York to represent the Mets since you retired? This is the first time, and it's the first time I've been to City Field. It's the first time I've been back in that capacity. And what kind of goes through your head when you come back after all these years to the organization that you broke in with? It makes me realize this was the first organization to give me a first chance to play. And I feel like this is home. I feel like this is my, my birth in baseball. And I feel like this is exactly where I belong. Well, you came up when the Mets were in the midst of rebuilding. First draft pick, were you like fifth overall or something? I was like third that? overall. Third overall. And when you came to the Mets, things were just changing here. The ownership had just changed. They were starting slowly to climb out from a few really bad years. And fellows like yourself, Mookie Wilson, Wally Backman, all came up pretty close to the same time. When you reflect on those days, did you see the roots of a championship team even back then? Oh, in 1983 is when I really started realizing that things were starting to change because they were calling all of us up, Jeff Reardon, Mike Scott, Wally Backman, we were all being called up. And you could see that things were changing. And then they made the deal for Keith Hernandez. That made a big difference. And we all could see, well, things are going to be a little different. And they were going in that direction. It was pretty exciting, too. You know, you talk about exciting and I've always said that for as long as the Mets have been around since 1962, so we're talking about 58 years of baseball, apart from the years that they've been in postseason, certainly winning championships, nothing was more fun around here than 1984 because you could see everything. It was like spring. Everything just blossomed. And all these kids were finally starting to become not just big leaguers, but really good big leaguers including yourself, what does that year conjure up when you think back to oh, it? I think that might have been one of the best years I ever had in my career because I started having confidence. I could believe in myself a bit, coming into my own, realizing what I could do. And the team started to win some games toward the end of that year. You won 90 games that year, and you'd been around the Mets since the end of 1980, and nobody was talking about winning 90 games in 80 or 81 or 82 or 83. What brought everything together in that magic year of 84? Well, sometimes things get contagious, and we started doing good things. You know, the youngsters, we were at the point where it was either we had to make that transition, and we were making that transition. We were pretty good. We started believing that we were pretty good and it started to reflect itself on the field. And we couldn't wait to get on that field because I know what it's like to, to lose 90 games. And in, the, in, the, in the interim, we were winning. And in 84, you're playing for a guy who's managing for the first year in his career in the major leagues, and Davey Johnson. You played for Joe Torre and George Bamberger and Frank Howard. What made it click between those 84 Mets, never mind 85, 6, and beyond, but the 84 Mets and Davey was like a perfect marriage. How come? Well, I think what Davey did for me, he was the first one to sit me down and tell me, look, we need you. This is what I think you can do for us. And nobody had ever told me that before. And I felt pretty good about that. And as a team, he knew what best lineups to put out there every single day and he treated us all like we were pretty good players with a whole lot of respect. When you were drafted, you were drafted as a shortstop mm -hmm. and so for a little bit of time maybe within the organization the expectation was you would be the eventual shortstop for the New York Mets and then other kids came along. I know Wally played a little shortstop and Jose Okendo came along. When you're a shortstop, generally speaking, you're the best athlete on the field. And then when you get into pro ball and towards the major leagues and they move you off of shortstop, was that a tough adjustment for you? No. No, it wasn't. Because I was always raised by my dad, doesn't matter where you play, you're still a ball player. Which position did you embrace the most? Was it third base or did you feel, I know you played in the outfield a little bit later in your career. Well, see, I was raised by my dad to play all over. And so it really didn't matter to me. As long as I was out there playing, that was the most important thing. I had a chance to play. So it didn't matter. I had a chance to play, help the team, 
be in that lineup, that was good enough for me. Well, you come up late in 1980, and the team had actually hung in the race that year until around the middle of July, and then things started to go backwards. But now you start looking at this infusion of kids coming up through the minor league system, yourself and Mookie, uh, and you guys came up virtually together. Did you maintain a relationship well beyond your days as a Met? Oh, with yeah, we did. We still do. It's always a pleasure to see Mook. You know, you have some things that are never going to leave you. And when you're trying to make it and you're trying to make it together, those are things that you never lose because you know exactly where you were at one time and you know exactly where you've been. And you had yeah. some good years with the Mets and then came a phone call, I guess, in December of 1984 as the Mets had really turned the corner. What are your basic recollections of the Does news it, you got and, and whether or not you had any inkling it was coming? Well, no, I didn't think it was coming. I was I, I, exactly Monday night. It was a Monday night. And I got the call that I had been traded. Is that Frank Cashin who called you or did Montreal's GM call you? No. I got a call later on that night, but I heard about it on t television. Really? Watching Monday night football. Wait a minute now. So yeah. you're watching the football game. Yeah. You've already been traded for Gary Carter. You're part of the Mets package that went to the Expos yep. for Gary Carter. And the first you heard of it was from Howard Cosell? From Monday Night Football, yeah. And that was only because I wasn't home. And then when I did get home, my phone was ringing, 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 ringing. And they said the Mets have made a trade. And that phone kept ringing, <laughs> ringing. And I refused to pick it up. And I said, oh, I've been traded. Then eventually, after it rang a million times, I picked it up. But after it rang so much, and on TV they said the Mets had made a trade, I knew I was involved in the trade because my phone kept ringing and ringing That's and ringing and ringing. It's such a different world that as you watch this, you may not even understand that there were no cell phones back in 1984. There was no internet back in 1984. So if somebody tried to reach you and you didn't pick up because you weren't home, they weren't going to get in touch with you. Did you have any idea after the fact, once you learned that you'd been traded to the Expos, how long somebody had been trying to reach you before they finally got through? Oh, yeah, I realized it. I, but Are we I talking hours to... and hours and hours? Or... Well, the phone rang and rang and rang. I, w I wasn't home when the trade went down. I wasn't home. I was out that day. Eventually, I got home. Turned on TV on, was watching football, and they mentioned the trade, and the phone kept ringing and ringing. It would stop for a minute. It would ring again. Well, why didn't you answer it? Because it could have been I was afraid to answer it. But they said on, the, on TV that you were traded. That's you, what made me afraid if you don't to answer. The I phone, didn't want to hear it. The trade's not going through. I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to be traded. <laughs> well, that's so I didn't want to. I didn't want to, I didn't want to answer that because I knew what the call was about. Did it hurt? Oh, it was painful. You know, when you get traded from the first team you've ever played with when you feel like this is where your home is, yeah, it hurts because it takes you by surprise and you think that, oh, now they don't want me after you realize that this is my first organization, you want to do well by them, and then this happens. Yeah, it's painful. Was it more painful because after a few bad years the Mets had finally turned the corner and you were expecting to be part of something good? Was that pretty much the biggest source of the pain at that time? First of all, my first team. You know everybody in the organization. You've come up with a bunch of players. And second of all, I felt I was right there coming into my own. I was ready to go. I was ready to help this team win. And I was looking forward to the following season because I knew that I was going to help them win that following season. And that happened. And it's almost like Hopes dashed, dreams dashed. Did it help at all that you were traded for a guy that was on his way to the Hall of Fame? Well, it didn't matter at the time. The only thing that mattered, mattered was I got traded. It didn't matter who it was for. But as time went on, I had to realize something. Wait a minute, you're still playing Major League Baseball, so the best thing to do is make the best of it and go out and, and hold your end of the deal. Can you look back and say that as your career blossomed, clearly in Montreal, driving in 100 runs one year, 
that in retrospect the trade might have been a good thing for you or can you never allow yourself to look at it that way? I thought it was a good thing for me because I had that opportunity and I took it and ran with it. But if I had to do it over again, no, I wouldn't have been traded. I still regret that I was traded from that team because it was such a good team. And I knew so many of the guys. And you want to be successful with the guys. You want to win with the guys. I don't have the numbers in front of me. But my memory tells me that you hit the Mets pretty well once you came back as a Montreal Expo. I can only imagine how much extra motivation you might have had in playing against the team that traded you. Was that a significant thing well, to you? Well, you want to do well against the team that traded you. So you'll let them know what you traded away. And not only that, though, you'll feel better about yourself, mm -hmm. too. You know, and, and, and that'll help me. It helped me move on, too. Much later in your career, you went out to Los Angeles, which is home for you, and you played for the Dodgers. Now, there are a lot of players. Darryl Strawberry is one of them, your former teammate, who to this day will say the worst thing he ever did was go home because the distractions are so plentiful. You've got friends who you never knew who all of a sudden were your best friends in second and third grade who wanted to chum up to you. Did you find, I know you were an older, more mature player by the time you got to L.A. near the end of your career, but was that difficult for you in any way, going back home to play? The first maybe month might have been difficult because you're trying to make everybody happy. <laughs> but after that first month, I had to realize, well, I'm here to do a job. I don't have time to worry about a whole lot of other things, but the first month was a little difficult. But after that, I was on my way because I didn't allow the distractions. I did not allow the distractions. And they could have been, but I didn't allow that. You know, played for a few other teams, but along the way, you found your way back to the Mets near the end of your career. Did that soothe any of the pain of having been traded? Well, yeah, it did. I was happy to come back because, uh, like I said, it was my first team. So it was, I was happy to come back, and I always enjoyed playing here anyway. Take me back to those years you played for the Mets the first time around, though. I know that, as we mentioned earlier, there were some pretty tight bonds that formed within that clubhouse. Who were you closest to on that team, and do you stay in touch with any of them to this day? Well, I was pretty close with Mookie Wilson, pretty much. Um, we came up through the minor leagues, and we were pretty close because we were in the minor leagues together. We did a lot of things together. And I was pretty close with Mookie. And you played with a rookie in 1983 named Darrell Strawberry, who wound up winning the Rookie of the Year from Los Angeles, your hometown, a few years younger than you. Did you have any kind of connection with Darrell? Well, yeah, we were friends and, and everything, and we got along well, and I was happy for him. And we were waiting for him to get here. Yes. Because he was such a good player. His first manager was Frank Howard, who became the interim manager after George Bamberger basically retired in June of 1983. There's a great story, by the way. Tell me if this is true or not, because you hear things over the years and maybe they get a little exaggerated, but the team had been losing. It's early June. George Bamberger had health problems earlier in his career. I guess he'd had a heart issue. And I guess things were not going well for the Mets early in 1983. And as the story goes, you guys are in L.A. And he walks into the clubhouse and he says, Boys, I'm going fishing. Turns, walks out of the room, and that was basically the last you guys saw or heard of him. Did it happen something like that? It happened pretty close to that. <laughs> he got us all together. We're all sitting around. And I think we we're in the midst of a losing streak oh, at you the were. time. And he says, uh, what am I trying to say, boys? He says, well, this is what I'm going to say. Well, I'm going fishing. <laughs> and exactly what, that's exactly how it happened. Had, and we all understood what that meant. Did he just walk out of the room at that time? Well, no, he didn't, he didn't just out. walk out, but yeah. he just said, I'm going fishing and, and good luck to everybody, but he's got to go. And Frank Howard comes in, who's just one of the great people who ever graced the game of baseball. Big and big when it comes to voice and stature, too. Did he have a way of getting your attention that maybe no other manager could just because of his demeanor? Well, he would talk to everybody. He was a person of um, high, high confidence. He'd give you confidence. He'd tell you what you could do. And he'd tell the team what he thought we should be doing. And as big as he is and as boisterous as he could be, I thought he was great for us at the time. 
you may or may not remember this, but in Darrell Strawberry's rookie year, he hit a fly ball to medium range center. Didn't run it out. The ball fell in. Darrell's only on first base. After the game, Frank kept that clubhouse door closed. And while we were waiting outside to come in, you could literally hear Hondo's voice booming through these pretty thick walls and doors. And the one line that he kept referring to over and over, he kept saying, the cheapest commodity in our business is 90 feet. Was that something he said a lot, or did he have any other sayings that you would hear over and over and over? Well, that was one thing he, he really believed in. There's no reason not to hustle. There's no reason not to hustle. Play the game right. Bust your tail. Because the minute you don't, it's going to show up, and it's going to embarrass everybody, not only you, but the whole team. Which was your favorite memory as a Met, as a player? Whether it's your first hit, biggest hit, first home run, biggest home run, anything stand out when you reflect back to these days? I just think the first time I got a Mets major league uniform, that was the biggest, biggest moment. It was a high number, so I, as I recall. Yeah, it was number 69. You had to change that. But Yeah, it changed. But the <laughs> thing is, I, I finally got a major league uniform. I was playing in New York, and that was really, really the best thing I, at that point that ever happened to me. Did seven mean anything to you? When you did you take that number because you wanted it? I had seven for uh, college, and I thought seven was a lucky number. So I chose seven as my lucky number. Hopefully, I'll have good luck while I played. And do you look back at it now as a very lucky number? Oh, I still do. Well, we still look back at uh, having Hubie Brooks as a New York Met is a very happy thing for us, too. So it's great seeing you, Hubie. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Howie. I'm happy to be back. Hubie Brooks, former New York Met, with us on One on One. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time.